So spectroscopy is the science of taking light and putting it through a disperser. And here we have prisms, we know prisms will disperse the light. That means break it into its component colors. You're holding a different technology in your hands. That's a disperser, the diffraction grating. We'll explain how it works in lesson four when we talk about telescopes and instruments. Until then, you can just accept it. We experienced yesterday something that disperses the light, and you can see the component colors. Well, there are three different types of spectra that we deal with. So let's list them here and some of their properties. We have continuous. And we've already worked through an example of a continuous spectrum, and that's a black body, or thermal. Again, this is referring to a particular mechanism, thermal, things with temperature, just a way of shaking the charge to get a particular type of continuous spectrum. But there are other ways to shake charge. You can use magnetic fields to shake charge, and you can get different types of continuous spectrum. It's continuous if it's emitting at all wavelengths. And you saw an example of that yesterday with the, the light bulb. You can also have absorption line spectra. And all three of these, these are all spectra. It's the plural, spectrum is the singular. And absorption line spectra, you can get that, astrophysically a common way to get that is if there is a cloud of gas between the star, let's say we're looking at a star, source of continuous light, and us, if there's a cloud of gas in between, and it, it can be a cloud of space, it could be our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is gas, and it does the same thing. It will absorb a particular wavelength. So you let it go through the cloud of gas, through the prism, spread it out, you see the continuous spectrum, but certain wavelengths are missing. If I use a different gas, like if we're, if we're talking about the atmosphere, there's a lot of oxygen, a lot of nitrogen, they absorb in a particular kind of way. If I go in my laboratory and get like a container of hydrogen and shine light through the hydrogen, I'll get a different type of absorption spectrum. If I use helium, I get a different type of absorption spectrum. So the sequence of lines, this is the sequence you get for hydrogen, it turns out, depends uh, very much on the composition. It also depends on the temperature. If I have hydrogen gas kind of at uh, 10,000 degrees, I'll get that kind of a spectrum. If I have it cooler, I'll get a different spectrum, one that actually appears out in the ultraviolet. If I have it hotter, I'll get a different spectrum, one that appears in the infrared. So each element has different spectra associated with it. So it's very much about composition and temperature to determine what you see. So that's absorption line. It's kind of a combination of continuous minus certain wavelengths. Then you have emission line. If I were to look at this cloud of gas from a different angle, an angle whose line of sight does not intersect the star. So let's say we're down here, and we're looking out. We're not looking at the star anymore. The star is off on the side, so we're not getting the continuous spectrum. But that cloud of gas is emitting light, but the light is only at particular wavelengths, and we call that an emission line spectrum. And surprise, surprise, the emission lines you get tend to be same ones as the absorption lines from the other vantage point. Now you may get different amounts of green versus red in absorption than you do in emission, but you often get the same sequence of lines. It depends upon the composition, it depends upon the temperature. There's something in the gas that is absorbing at quantized wavelengths and then re-emitting it in all directions. Some of it does go back you know, into the direction of the absorption line spectrum. It's not totally gone there. Just the vast majority of the light it's missing that absorption line spectrum has been remitted in all sorts of other directions. So what you see depends upon the angle that you're looking at it and looking at the source of the continuous emission. Make sense? Okay, let's formalize this here. This was all figured out by Kirchhoff. And uh, he put it down in three empirical laws. So we talked about empirical law and physical law. This is an example of empirical law. He didn't try to explain this. He was just messing around in his laboratory trying to figure out the conditions to get these three types of spectra. And we've already talked about some of the conditions, but let's write it down formally. Now in the supplemental notes I have it all written out in words. In the textbook it's in words. On the internet it's in words. Here I'll just do kind of an outline form. If you have a luminous solid, Movement, 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 us. There we go. 
solid, just didn't look right, or a luminous liquid, or hot, opaque gas. Those are the conditions that will give you a continuous spectrum. Let's think of some examples. What's an example of a luminous solid? Have you ever seen a solid? Exactly. You saw it just last class. The filament in the light bulb is a piece of metal that's solid. You glow. So if I can heat like metal up hot enough or anything up hot enough, it will glow. Metal is just easy to do because we can send electricity through it and you can use that as a source of the heat. <laughs> luminous liquid. What's a good, maybe natural example of luminous liquid? A good man-made example would be, you know, you heat up the solids until it melts. But uh, how about a natural example? Lava. Yeah. And that's rock. That's not metal. There's probably some metal in it, but it's primarily rock. It's been heated up to the point that it melted, and it's flowing, but it's hot enough that it glows. Uh, that's really fire uh, creatures like fireflies. Bioluminescent creatures. No, that's going to be... Um, I, I'm not familiar with the exact process, but it's not thermal. They're like, take a firefly, it's not like its butt is in 6,000 degrees. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be happy if it was. So, but there are other ways, like the emission line spectrum, but you don't have to get it as hot as in the thermal case to get emission. Atomic transition will give us that kind of stuff. And hot, opaque gas, and the opaque part is key. The gas in this room is not opaque, it's transparent, we can see through it, but you can imagine, well, stars are a great example of an opaque gas. You can't see through a star, though it's made of gas. So if the gas is dense enough and the right stuff is in there, it will not be transparent, it will be opaque. And if it's also hot, it glows, giving you a continuous spectra. So these three types of, these three categories of objects will give you a continuous spectrum. Kirchhoff's second law has to do with the emission line spectra. So to get an emission line spectrum, you need a hot or a heated gas, but it has to be a transparent gas. If it's opaque, you're going to get a continuous spectrum, but if it's transparent and it's hot or heated, if it's just cold sitting there, it's not going to emit anything. But if there's a source of heat, maybe a star inside of it or outside of it, illuminating it, heating certain components of it, and we'll talk about why it behaves the way it does, but Kirchhoff didn't know that. He just was measuring these things and realized if I have a transparent gas and I heat it and it still stays transparent and I look at it, it will emit emission lines. It will actually glow, but not at all colors, just at very particular colors. And then Kirchhoff's third law has to do with the absorption lines. And the way you get this is also a transparent gas, but it has to be backlit. The backlighting gives you the continuous portion of it. A backlit, cool, transparent gas. So it's backlit, it's cool. If it's cool, it's going to absorb the light just at particular wavelengths. It lets the other wavelengths through. That's the transparent part. The big difference between emission line and continuous really is transparent or opaque. If you have this hot gas and it's transparent, it's emitting just those lines. But if the gas suddenly became opaque, those lines are going to have a hard time getting out of the gas, getting out of the cloud. They're going to bounce around. They're going to scatter. They're going to break apart. And by the time they actually make it to the edge of the cloud. By the time those wavelengths of light make it to the edge of the cloud, it's been converted into all the different wavelengths, all the different colors. And so an emission line spectrum could be the source in a cloud, but the cloud's opaque. It comes out as a continuous spectrum. Okay, so those are Kirchhoff's laws. These are empirical. Talk about different types of laws. These are purely empirical. It's not trying to explain them physically, but they're useful to know. We can use this as a tool, even if we don't understand what's going on physically. I haven't yet explained why this is the case, but we can use it as a tool to learn compositions and temperatures. If I go to my lab and I take hydrogen gas, I can find out what its 
absorption spectrum, its emission spectrum looks like. If I change its temperature, I can see how the spectrum looks different at different temperatures. Then I go out and look at something astrophysically. If I see that pattern, I know that's hydrogen at this temperature. Even if it's like a bajillion light years away, I can tell you what that's made of. If I check all the different elements here on Earth, I can figure out the composition and the temperature of something so far away. And that's really powerful. Astronomy is more than just making pretty pictures. We actually want to understand physically what's going on. It's hard, so it's not in our laboratory. We can't get there. So whatever tricks we can use, and that's why we're spending so much time studying light, is there's all sorts of tricks embedded into it that give us information. Okay, so let's actually try this. So we'll use the diffraction gratings. I'll turn the lights off. What I have here are four tubes. Up here, well, up here I have six. Hydrogen, sodium, helium, neon, mercury. These are the spectra you get, at least in the visible part of the spectrum, for these different elements. I have four of the tubes here. We'll see if you can identify them. And it's the same concept. If you can identify them at 10 feet or 20 or 30 feet, we can identify them at 10, 20, 30 light years. So let's do this. And first, I always got to remind myself of the message. It says, do not put fingers in socket when turned on. Good message. So pull your gratings out, and you can identify these things for me. This one would be an easy one. I have four. I have four of the six. Yeah, I heard down front. Can you all see all those lines? What color are the lines? For the most part, red. Right? I, I can tell that even without a grading, that most of the lines are red. But does it match kind of the neon spectrum you see up on the board? Okay. So you, you suppose that was not right in front of you, but a thousand light years away, that's the spectrum, you know there's neon in that cloud. That scares me. I didn't put my fingers in, but it did scare me. Okay, this one is the most common spectrum in the universe. Kind of gives it away. It's from the most common element in the universe. What's that? Hydrogen. You got the one red line and the converging sequence to the blue. So when I look at it with my naked eye, red and blue make purple. I see kind of purple, pinkish. But you see the actual signature looking through the gratings. I'll give you all a chance to check it out. Question. Do the spectra extend beyond visible light? Yes. There are other emission lines in the infrared and other emission lines in the ultraviolet. And for hydrogen, you're going to become very familiar with those different lines. Now, to get these lines, it has to be at a particular temperature. I change the temperature, the lines will shift to the ultraviolet or a set of lines in the infrared. So this is just the right temperature to make it glow in the visible. Okay, two more. What's this thing here? Oh, okay. So this, we didn't even know this element was around until we observed it in the sun. That inert gas that doesn't interact with anything. Uh, we named it helium after helios, sun. It was first discovered in the sun spectroscopically. Then we realized we have it here on Earth. It just doesn't interact, so we didn't really realize it. Y'all get your chance? Yes. All right. I'll move to the last one. Helium is the second most abundant element in the universe. And my last one here. Anyone know what this is yet? Mercury. That's right. Do you see the double yellow line? Yeah. So mercury has this double yellow line, but also has these green and blue and violet lines. Sodium, I mean, while you're looking at that, I'll talk about sodium. I don't happen to have a sodium tube. But sodium is just that double yellow line. 
And uh, astronomers, we're big advocates of sodium lights. If you go out and look at street lights, you have your white street lights and you have your yellow street lights. The yellow ones are the sodium lights, and they're only emitting at these two wavelengths. And of course, whatever lighting we have outside, some of it gets bounced up into the sky and bounces down off of the atmosphere to us, making doing astronomy from the ground increasingly difficult. But if communities choose to use sodium lights, they're only screwing up these two wavelengths. We can put a filter on our telescope to avoid those two wavelengths, and hence the sky looks dark. Solid contamination is localized, just in the yellow. So, you know, if there's an expansion project around where you live, encourage them to use the sodium lights. Turn that off. Okay, let's see here. We'll turn this back on. Low light level. And my pen. Okay, so clearly I convinced you you can identify compositions. If you knew a little bit more of the physics, you could also pick out the temperatures and what you're looking at here. Now, astrophysically, it's a little bit more complicated. We don't have pure hydrogen clouds and pure oxygen clouds. It's all a bunch of stuff mixed together. So this is kind of a common, typical astrophysical spectrum. There's mostly hydrogen there. We've got this big, uh, that red line there is the red line you saw in hydrogen. We have it as an intensity plot, but also as a spectrum like the ones you just saw. There's clearly hydrogen there. But there are all these other lines, all those zigs and zags. It's not noise, those are lines and emission processes at work. And there are people who are spectroscopists, and they're experts at looking at this stuff, and they can say, oh yeah, there's hydrogen here, there's helium, neon, there's oxygen. And they can also tell you the temperature, because if it were a different temperature, you'd have, you wouldn't see the neon, or you'd see more of the oxygen. And all the different elements, their signature changes with temperature, but they would they all need to agree here that that cloud is just one temperature, and they always do. Now, you should look at this and say, well, the neon lines are about as strong as the helium lines, so there's as much helium as neon. And that's not true at all. Neon's pretty rare in the universe, helium's very abundant, but it really depends on temperature as well as composition. Even though there's a lot of helium, at this temperature, it may not emit very well, at least not in the visible band. It may be screaming uh, bright in the ultraviolet, for all we know. But at this temperature, neon may emit really well in the visible band. So really, it's the combination. You get these complicated spectra, but we, we can do it. The good ones can do it by eye, but there's also software. We plug it in the software and says, your cloud is made of these things and these compositions, and this is the temperature of your cloud or your star.